So if you join the Jesus movement, right? I mean, that's what it's about. That's, it's the goodness of God as it plays out through Jesus who invites you and I into his movement in the world. And what we believe, you need to hear this loud and clear, what we believe about the work of God, the word of God, the worthiness of God, that is what matters most in life. And as we look at his word today and we look at what we believe, because that's the title of the message today, we believe. What is it that we believe? What is it that we believe about Jesus and what he's doing in our world? And the answers to those questions will fundamentally change our lives for the good, as we just sang. In Acts 1 verse 8, in the book of Acts, that's where we're at in this series. We, we looked at this last week, and, it, and it's kind of the template for the, the whole book of Acts and the movement of God in the early church. It says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so th- as they heard that, they demonstrated a belief in that. They demonstrated a belief that Jesus is true, God is always faithful to his promises, and we're gonna wait on him, and we're gonna, when he begins to move, we're gonna move with him, and because of that, you and I, if we're believers in Jesus Christ, in this part of the country, this part of the world, are the result of those that believed. You see, when we believe, it has implications, and that can ripple for generations. There's actually a story I love. I think I've told it before, so if you've heard it, uh, there's a French aerial, like, tightrope artist. Uh, his name was Charles Blondin. This was in the 19th century, and around 1859, he was uh, really famous. This is about 160 feet up in the air above Niagara Falls. And uh, he, this, this joker was crazy. Like, this guy would not just cross the falls, but he did it blindfolded. He did it with stilts. He, at one point, I don't even understand this one, stopped and cooked and ate an omelet on the tightrope. Like, I didn't know how you do that, right? And, And so this was who he was, and he was known for this. And crowds would show up, and they would cheer because they believed that he could do that. And there was actually uh, one of the most famous stories about him is he, he crossed once with a wheelbarrow. And as he crossed with that wheelbarrow, he got to the other side and he asked the crowd, how many of you believe that, that I could do this with a person in the wheelbarrow? And of course the crowd's like, yeah, you're the best. You could do it. We believe. And he said, okay, who'd like to get in? <laughs> Zero. Zero signed up that day because they believed partially. You see, real belief biblically means we get in that wheelbarrow, that we trust who God is and what he says and and, and what he leads. So as we look at scripture today, he's inviting us to place our faith in him and who he is. And if you don't have a Bible and you're new to to, to church and, and all of that. We just want to let you know we, we have Bibles in our chairs. Uh, you're welcome to take it. It's a gift from us. Like, you're not stealing it. Like, we want to give it to you, okay? And for those of you that are regulars, I just want to continue and invite you, bring your Bibles, right? We want to get into the Word of God together, right? Okay. Yes, it'll still be on the screen too. All right, it'll be there. So let's, uh, let's look today at what we believe. Acts 2, verse 1, says, When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. As we look at that word Pentecost, many of us have heard it if we've been around the church world. And, and, and you need to know, it, in, for those that were, it was written in the original language, and, and for the Greeks, Pentecost meant 50th day. And, and, and you need to understand that that actually what's happening here is they're celebrating what would be known as the Feast of Weeks. The Feast of Weeks, where all of these people had come into Jerusalem to honor and to worship the goodness of God. That they believed God was good. He was so good that they would arrive to celebrate this 50 days after Passover. You see, it's interesting when you look at rhythms 
and how they help us remember. Isn't it interesting how we often can have what I would call like gospel amnesia? Amnesia about the goodness of God? And what we see in scripture are these moments where they're celebrating. So Passover would celebrate for them the reality that God is a God who had delivered them from bondage and slavery. And that Jesus in the same way does that for us today. And and at Pentecost on the 50th day, we'll see what it led to. But, But you need to understand they're there because they're celebrating the Feast of Weeks. The the Feast of Weeks, actually, if you look in Scripture, was this moment where they would be there to bring the first fruits of their their harvest. And they would bring that first fruit to God and say, God, look at how good you are. And that's that's what we're supposed to be doing with our tithe and offering. Amen? Amen. Right? We bring our first fruits. And, And so they would bring it and they would say, God, you're so good. Thank you for providing. And then they were also asking for God to bless the rest of the harvest. And and as they're there in this moment, it's a moment where they're together in one place and they're gathered in, as we saw at the end of Acts chapter one, in unity. And in this reality for us is that again, there's this act of remembering. Why do we come together on, on the weekend, right? Why do we gather for services? Because it reminds us in a dark and fallen world, how good God is. You see, you need to know you have an enemy. John 10.10 10 says that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. According to Genesis 3, he's, that the enemy set in motion this pattern where he tries to attack the word of God, the work of God, and the worthiness of God. And when you begin to see that throughout scripture, and then you, in your own life, look and go, oh, that's why I'm doubting the word of God. That's why I'm struggling to be a part of the work of God. That's why I'm wondering, is God really good? I mean, we don't like to admit that we have these questions, but we have a God who shows us that these are places that the enemy attacks. And here's the, the early church gathered there and about to experience a move of God that would reinforce the work of God, the worthiness of God, and the worship of God. I cannot emphasize to you enough what you believe matters so much. And as as we dig into this today, and in this moment, I wanted you to understand the context. Now let's read on in verse two and four. It says, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound, like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. This is likely the upper room. It's a large room that we know, according to Acts 1, could house at least 120 people. It says, and it divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. You're taking notes. What do we believe? We believe God is good. Jesus is for us. And the Holy Spirit fills us at conversion. And I want to unpack this for you because in this moment in Pentecost, we see a people who are saying God is good. We're here to celebrate that and bring our first fruits. We also see as the passage goes on and the rest of the New Testament goes on that Jesus is for us. That that in fact, we would say you, you and I need to start there to realize that God is good and Jesus is for you. That may be different than what you've heard. That may be different than the church you grew up in or the things you've seen on social media. But when you realize that Jesus is so much for you, he laid down his life for you. He loves you beyond anything this world can ever offer you. He is for us, amen? Amen. And then when we understand that the Holy Spirit fills us at conversion, you see, for them, This was setting in motion a fulfillment, a fulfillment, not a pattern. There's a difference. Some can get caught up in in how does the Holy Spirit work, and we're going to get to that in a minute. And and we can think that we've got to have rushing wind and and, and the fire. And in all of those things, I believe God can do, because my God, he created it all. Anybody? Anybody? Like he's able, he's God. If he wants to move in an unusual way, 
then I'm going to get out of his way. Anybody? Because I ain't God. But what this is setting in motion is actually a moment where from that moment forward, the Holy Spirit would fill believers at conversion. Now, some of you know your Bible really well and you're looking ahead in the book of Acts and you're like, well, what about that moment with the Samaritans later in Acts? And, and what about with the Gentiles later in Acts? Well, those were moments where God would supernaturally show people that he was grafting all into his family. You see, this is what would be known in theological circles as a theophany. Theophany is a, a revelation of God, an appearance of God. And so he's appearing with the sound like wind, which they would have recognized according to scripture. Think of like a moment in 1 Kings 19 where Elijah heard the whisper. And it says that, that he wasn't in the earthquake, he wasn't in the lightning, he wasn't in the rushing wind, he was in the whisper. They would have recognized that God's spirit is moving in this moment. And then the tongues of fire being divided over them would show them that the spirit is now filling them. You and I are filled as believers at conversion with the spirit. Listen to what Colossians 2, 9 through 12 says. It says, for in him the whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily. That's Jesus. And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Here's where it talks about baptism. Having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. You see, when we're baptized, it's symbolizing how Christ's spirit has raised us. It also says that we're filled with the spirit. And I wanna make sure we're clear on this. This issue of the Holy Spirit is a big deal because it's often the missing link in the life of a Christian. And for many Christians and churches, this is the missing link. You see, it's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Trinitarian God. And the work of the Holy Spirit is vital in the life of a believer. It's, it, it, it makes such a difference in our lives. So what does the Holy Spirit do? How does he work? The Holy Spirit is a div person and divine, part of the Trinity. Testifies to the risen Christ. Mediates God's presence. Imparts life. The Holy Spirit reveals truth. Fosters holiness bears fruit, gives spiritual gifts to the believers. Can I get an amen? amen? The Holy Spirit comforts. The Holy Spirit counsels. The Holy Spirit supplies power, which enables us to live for God and do what God has called us to do. The Holy Spirit affects unity. The Holy Spirit transcends all boundaries of age, race, or socioeconomic background. The Holy Spirit is freely given on the basis of repentance of sin. Holy Spirit is a part of the mission of God and the church, seeking to bring repentance and faith. The Holy Spirit fills all believers and commands submission and authority and lordship over the church and the church's mission. The work of the Holy Spirit in the life of a Christian, in the life of the church is vital and is often the missing link. What does that mean for us? Well, it means that God wants us to be open to what the Spirit wants to do in our lives. That we're not, as Galatians 5 talks about, caught in the flesh, but operating in the Spirit. And so does that, does that mean that everything is gonna always make sense. Well, it's always gonna line up to scripture, that I can assure you. Amen. Come on, church. Y'all are getting quiet, okay? I mean, at the end of the day, it all comes back to scripture. We come under the submission of the Lord and, and his word. And so what we believe, again, matters. Do we believe that the Holy Spirit is present, is active, is moving? I hope we do. 
Because that's what this was setting in motion. Now look at what happens next in verse five. It says, now they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. That's because they would have came from all over, Jewish and proselytes to the faith that had converted, were in this area of Jerusalem for Pentecost. From many nations, they were gathered there. Verse six, and at this sound, the multitude came together. Now the word sound there is a different Greek word. It isn't talking about the sound of the wind. I believe it's talking about the sound of what we'll hear next, which is the work of the spirit through the believers. Because it says this, at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? According to the research I did on this, Galileans had a certain dialect. It'd be like an accent. Like some of you are like, I'm here and I'm new. And all I know is that dude on stage doesn't have a Southern accent right now. (laughs) Right? And and so they, they would have heard that these are Galileans. They might have even had physical features that they would have known they were from Galilee, but they're actually hearing this in their own language. It says, how is that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes, verse nine, Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues, notice what they heard. They're hearing it in their own tongue, the mighty works of God. They're hearing about the goodness and might of God, of this God who is good, the way he works, the fact that Jesus is for them. You'll see that a little bit later. It says, and all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others, mocking, said they are filled with new wine. I mean, it kind of happens today, right? Yeah, you right? I mean, like, yeah, they're filled with wine. They're, they're, they're drunk, is what they're saying. And yet there's people there that are hearing it and going, no, no, this, this isn't new wine. This is a new move of the Spirit. This is God revealing himself in his heart. Amen. So as we look at these verses, there's a f- some things that are important for us that we believe. First, the Holy Spirit, if you're taking notes, works to unite and ignite his people for his plans. Amen. You see, if you go back in Scripture, first you have to understand that there is a spiritual gift of tongues that, that is a part of the body of Christ. We're talking about something different in this moment. If you want to look at the, the gift of tongues and the spiritual gift, go to 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. Great passage that shows us both the, the affirmation of the gift, but also how we apply it and use it in the body of Christ. Can I get an amen? Because it all comes back to scripture. In this moment, what's happening though is a, a, a reversal of the curse that had happened in Genesis 11. See, in Genesis 11, the people are filled with their flesh and pride. And, and they're beginning to work and do things unified on their own. And in Genesis 11, God steps in and says, I see what they're capable of if unified in the flesh and they're full of pride. So I'm gonna confuse their language and scatter them across the nations. Then in Genesis 12, there's a promise given to this man named Abraham, later known as Abram, who will be a father of many nations. He'll be a blessing. And so what we see at Pentecost is the spirit being poured out and God bringing them together to unify and unite them and also ignite them. Do you see it? That it's a reversal and it's, Because God is true to his promises, what he said and did in Genesis 11, he does again in Genesis 12 and now begins to fulfill it. If you're taking notes here, the Holy Spirit unites us to Jesus and to one another. And that's what they're beginning to recognize is 
And, and you'll see it in a minute when he begins to share the gospel, when Peter gets to the first sermon. It, the Holy Spirit is meant to unite you and I. And I want to tell you, I've been all over the world. I've, by God's grace, I've been, I think, I was trying to count this morning. I think it's been nine different countries uh, all over the world. And uh, on mission, but also with believers that are in those locations. And I can tell you, there is something that the love of Jesus and the presence of the Holy Spirit does in unifying us when I don't even speak the language. It is incredible. It is incredible how the Holy Spirit is meant to unite us, how much more so in a church, in a body of believers, where it's meant to bring us together to have common language, common love, a unity that you're not gonna find if you watch the news or turn on social media, right? So it's to unite and ignite us. A a few weeks ago, we had a chance uh, with my brother's family to to visit uh, Orlando. And as we were there for a couple of days, my brother had rented uh, a VRBO in a gated community. And we didn't understand that this gated community was really serious about security. Like, I live in one here and it's a little bit more lax, we'll just say that. This one was so strict that the morning after we get there, my wife Cindy goes to get some coffee for us at uh, one of the establishments locally. I, I, don't, I don't get any kickbacks on brandy, so I'm not giving them a shout out. <laughs> so she gets to the gate and as, as she gets to the gate, they're like, Mm-mm, your, your, your name isn't on our list. They had a clipboard and they said, your name isn't on here. And we're like, all right, you let us in last night. Well, yeah, yeah, we're gonna find out who did that because they shouldn't have let you in. So my brother jumps in the truck and he may or may not have pulled up fairly aggressively to that gate. He may or may not have came out very assertively and he may or may not have expressed some deep concern for how we were being treated. But I'll tell you this, when he finally got the phone number of the person that could put the name on the list, everything changed. Everything changed. Because now we were united with their establishment. And the, later that day when I left to go to the store, I just rolled down the window. I didn't have a traumatic experience. They looked at the clipboard, waved at me and said, yep, your name's on the list. We've got common language now. And you are united with our purposes and our intent." All right, what does Jesus do for you and I? He says, when you come to me, I'm gonna put my name, your name on my list. My name is on you. And not only is it on you, but it's united you to me and to my purposes and no gate will keep you out. And what I have for you, I'm gonna wave you through. I'm gonna show you. I, I'm going to ask you to be a part of what I have. That leads to the next point here. Not only does the Holy Spirit unite us, the Holy Spirit ignites us to live for Jesus and share Jesus with others. That, that we get excited about our faith, and, and you see it here in the text. Let me read to you verse 14. It says, But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Now, that but there is a big deal, okay? It's this moment that you go, well, who's Peter? Why, why does it matter? Why does Peter get to give this first message? And I believe so much of it is because the Holy Spirit had done such an incredible work that Peter is now like, I have to share it. If you know anything about Peter's story, this was a guy that was quick to the trigger. Quick to speak, quick to say things. So much so that when asked, do you believe in Jesus at the end of his life, aren't you one of his disciples? Peter denied three times. He, he actually betrayed and denied and walked away from Jesus. Jesus forgave him, restored him. And here he is standing up to deliver this first message. Why do I share that? Because each of us, have a story, and your past doesn't matter as much as your present in relationship to Jesus and what the Spirit wants to do through you. 
Revelation 12, 11 says this, and they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they love not their own lives even unto death. The blood of the lamb had covered Peter. He now was ignited to share his story. Pastor and author Tim Keller, the late Tim Keller says this, Jesus is the only savior in the world who if you gain him will satisfy you and if you fail him will forgive you. Peter knew this. You and I are invited into this to realize he's the one that will satisfy us. He's the one that will fulfill us. He's the one that will forgive us. And when we begin to walk in that and in the power of the Holy Spirit, he'll begin to use us to share our story with others. The real story You see, Peter was somebody who had confessed Christ and Jesus had said to him, on this rock, I will build my church, on this confession. Let me remind you in Matthew 16, verse 15 through 18, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? What do you believe, Jesus is asking. Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. For the flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, which I believe was the confession, the story he was telling, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And that's really good news. No other institution, no other organization, Governmentally, for profit, non profit, you name it, is guaranteed to prevail against the gates of hell. Amen. But the church of Jesus Christ is. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And the church of Jesus, operating, united in the Holy Spirit, ignited by the Holy Spirit, has a story to share. You have a story to share. Our world desperately needs the good news of Jesus. And that leads us into the, the last portion of the message here. What we see next is this sermon that Peter delivers. And so what do we believe? We believe the gospel of Jesus Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit will lead many to believe. Do you believe that? Do you believe that the good news of Jesus has impacted you, is worth sharing? Do you believe that the good news of Jesus and the work of the Holy Spirit? Because I gotta tell you, It ain't my job to convince anybody. It isn't your job. We share the good news and the Holy Spirit does the work to reveal, to convict, to lead people to the Lord. And what we see is is he begins to share is, is how that plays out, how this good news leads many to believe. I wanna just highlight a few aspects of this. I'm calling them, you know, gospel highlights. You'll go with me, I just wanna point these out because he gets up and he delivers an incredible sermon. A sermon that if you read it, takes a few minutes. But the impact of it is incredible. I don't have time to go through the whole thing right now, so I wanna highlight for you a couple of the, the moments that I think are significant. Verse 17 and 18. He says this, quoting the prophet Joel from the Old Testament. He says, in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, even on male and servants and female servants. In those days, I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. God predicted it, then he begins to fulfill it. He does the same thing today. What does that mean for a, a multi-generational church? We should be really thankful that God moves across every age and stage that he moves with men and women and every generation. What does that look like for us to, to say, yes, that's a part of the gospel? Look at what he says in verse 21 then. He goes on, still quoting the book of Joel. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That is good news. That when we call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved. Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth and believe with your heart, you will be saved. 
author and theologian N.T. Wright about this particular section of the sermon says this, this work of God is wonderfully inclusive because there is no category of people which is left out. Both genders, all ages, all social classes, but it is wonderfully focused because to all who call on the name of the Lord. Isn't that awesome? In a divided world, we have a God who underneath the cross of Jesus Christ shows us it's the most level ground and he brings us together. He goes on in the sermon, Acts 2, 22 through 24. It says this, jumping ahead a little bit. It says, men of Israel, hear these words, words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, can you say this Jesus? This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, meaning it was plan A, this was no mistake. He says, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Ouch, right? We need to hear the truth. They needed to hear the truth. God raised him up, loosing the pains of death because it was not possible for, possible for him to be held by it. I love that. I love the fact that death and sin has no victory for the believer in Jesus because Jesus is not held back by it. It's incredible to think about what that means for our lives. This is a part of the good news. So we don't have to fear death. We don't have to fear suffering. Yes, we will go through these things, but the comfort of the Lord is he has overcome and so shall we. Now, as it goes on, verse 31 through 36 is the last highlight I want to show you. He begins to speak about David from the Old Testament, a, a shepherd boy who became a king, who was used in some very incredible ways. Picking up in verse 31, he says, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this, that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For God did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you have crucified. He says, that's it, guys. You waited through the lineage of David. It's now fulfilled in Jesus. He is Lord and Christ. This is where it's all been headed. He's here. What are you going to do with it? And this is what happens next, right? They're faced with the question, what do we believe? Just as we are, what do we believe? Will we receive what God is doing, where God is leading us in his movement? Because it's his movement in this world. Will we receive it and respond or will we reject it and resist? Notice what happens next. And this is where we finish today, verses 37 through 41. It says, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises for you and your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. That'll still preach today, won't it? So those who received his word were baptized and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. What a moment, what a movement. And I just wonder where are you at and what do you believe? What have you decided? What is God asking of you in this season? I'm gonna ask you just two questions as we consider this because you've already heard we're heading into Baptism weekend. 
We have a number of people signed up. Maybe for you, that's the decision, though, you still need to make. What do you believe? What have you decided? You know, if you go to that link, there's an opportunity to tell us what you've decided, what you believe about Jesus, what you believe about baptism and maybe what God's asking. It's also a place to tell your story, just as Peter told his and led people to him. You and I are meant to share our stories and what God is doing. He wants to work through the power of his spirit in the life of every believer. Do you believe that? I hope we do. Because he has more for each of us. So secondly, will you let the Holy Spirit work to unite and ignite your life and our church for his plans? My hope is we hear through his word and through the spirit what God's calling us into, that he begins to unite us in new ways, that there's a little bit of igniting of our faith. Some of you, like you just need to be honest with the Lord. I'm dry and bored. (laughs) right he said it it happens what does it look like to say God ignite my faith again renew me refresh me ignite me by the power of your spirit I believe God wants to do that in each of us in this season wants to unite us and ignite us so I'm going to pray and then we're going to go to worship and praise Space up here will be available. I don't have a great illustration to land it. You're the illustration because it's an invitation. It's an invitation from the Lord. God, what do I believe? What do I need to lay down? What do I need you to do in my life? It's gonna be awesome to see what he does, isn't it? So Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the realities of the good news of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for believing in us enough to place your spirit inside of us because of the blood of the lamb. Forgive us for the moments where we reject, resist. God, I pray for a people that are responsive, receive all that you have and all that you want. So Lord, as we come to you now in prayer, as we come to you now in praise and worship, we just invite you to move among us. Unite us to you. Ignite us with your spirit to live for your plans and purposes. Thank you for this time of worship in Jesus' name.